The future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's good morning for us, but depending on where you are, good day, good afternoon, good night. Uh, thank you for coming to our talk, Red Team Handcuffs. I'm Kyle Bachman, and I'm joined today by my colleague and friend, Caleb McGarry. Uh, this is our agenda for the talk. We're quickly going to get into who we are, and we're going to discuss the constraints put upon us as a red team inside of Microsoft, and then wrap it up with hopefully a little bit of time to address some questions. This presentation is going to cover some of the constraints put against us in our rules of engagement. Every red teamer at Microsoft has to sign a document that basically goes over things that we are not allowed to do. Examples of this include uh, harvesting personal information not related to our assessment, denial of service attacks without express written consent from our customers, and any other actions that may impact the business in a negative way publicly. We don't want to bring down services that are live. And we do not want to unnecessarily attack our coworkers and make them feel uncomfortable at work or that we're in any way spying on them. Some rules of engagement may feel like they cannot be overcome with determination and a positive attitude. But in most cases, any rule of engagement working against you can be overcome with a little bit of imagination and engineering effort. So Caleb and I are members of the Serpent Pen Test team. Serpent stands for Services Pen Test. We are a team of eight who are responsible for cosine, gaming, and devices. Cosine is basically everything that is Microsoft Windows that doesn't reside on your computer. So things like Windows Update or signing. Um, devices is basically our line of surfaces and all other hardware, um, including the security of our factories. And gaming is our Xbox line, Xbox Game Pass, um, Xbox Live, etc. So our LinkedIn's can be found here at the bottom. Feel free to uh, connect with us and reach out if you think of a question um, and we're already uh, out of time or you think of it tomorrow or something, feel free to ask it. So a quick definition here on handcuffs. We are going by that second definition where a rule of engagement is something to restrain us. So we are going by the restrained by definition for the purposes of this talk. And now we're gonna get into some of those handcuffs. I'm now gonna hand it over to Caleb who will go over our first handcuff and show how we as a team have overcome this restraint with engineering effort. Caleb. Sure, thank you, Kyle. So I'm going to try and use the real world example for each one of these limitations that we talk about and then relate to how we have to deal with it since we want to achieve the same goal. And so for this one, I'm gonna talk about Stuxnet. And I'm just happy to picking on this on Stuxnet because it was a long time ago and it's fairly well known, although this example applies to almost every modern malware campaign. When you're attacking a target as a red teamer, you have a goal of don't give any risk to the company, obviously that you're attacking, and you don't want to expose yourself. You don't want to be detected prior to accomplishing your goal. And so real world attackers often have the same goal. However, they have the advantage that they don't have to use resources that they control. And this is important because when attackers think about their risks, right? They want to break into your company, they want to be undetected, and then they want to get your data or they want to do some action on objective. But the way in which those risks matter to them is slightly different in how they matter to us. So for an attacker, it's far more uh, important not to be detected in advance, right? Because they have a time investment, they have a tooling investment, into their attack that they're going to use when they come at you. And if they are detected early on in their kill chain or early on in the kill chain, uh, that investment is wasted. And so oftentimes they'll use resources that they can use to hide who they are, that they can use to obfuscate where they're coming from, but they won't have total control over them. And that's not necessarily something that we can do. And Stuxnet is a famous example of this because I've got some domain names listed here that they used, but they also hosted out of servers, say from Germany or from places uh, that you know, were hard to figure out who they were or where they were coming from. And this is very common when we see actual attackers that come against Microsoft, right? They'll hide behind a VPN, they'll use a host out of, you know, uh, say a disputed region in Ukraine, they'll use a shady ISP, um, they'll use something, they'll compromise someone else's server and then they'll attack us from that. But there are some risks there. Obviously they don't control that environment and they are potentially exposing some of our data if they were stealing it uh, to someone else. And so this gets into why we can't do this. Oops. 
Okay, cool. So um, we can't do this because we can't afford to have the risk of having our data leak externally, right? If I compromise an environment and I take some data out of there, which is pretty common, and it gets leaked ex externally as part of my attack chain, uh, I will actually cause a problem to our business, right? I'll have public impact to Microsoft. Whereas if an attacker compromises Microsoft and they steal some of our data and they take it externally, it doesn't really cause any issues to them, right? It may make the data that they stole less valuable to them, but it doesn't necessarily impact them in a super negative manner. And that's not something that I can afford to have happen as a risk. And so because of this, I have to maintain complete control over all the resources that I use uh, at any given time or I have to have at least complete control over all the data that goes in transit through those resources at any given time. And this causes some challenges, right? So if I'm hosting out of Azure or say a cloud environment, like you're another company and you're hosting out of a cloud environment that your company uses, uh, the blue team, they can cheat. They can simply go say, hey, uh, we see some traffic going to this Azure subscription. Oh, it's owned by the red team. This is the red team and therefore their response will be different. Or they'll say, hey, we see some traffic that's going to this IP, we know who owns that IP it's the red team, and it may shorten the response time. And it will change the way the response works. And so as a red team, it's our job to be the sparring partner of the blue team. And so we want to force them to go through all the steps uh, as part of their incident response process. We need them to actually have the challenge of trying to figure out who that attacker is, of trying to gather telemetry, of trying to get a full memory dump because they are unable to rely on say network traffic or other indicators to figure out who we are. And, and that's harder. Uh, if I, have, if I cannot use a resource that is outside uh, their visibility boundary. Uh, the last item is also kind of important because it actually adds significant overhead cost to you as a red teamer. Uh, you have to be able to deconflict, and I'll talk about this a little bit further on uh, in this presentation with your blue team 100%, right? You don't ever want to run the risk that you are creating a real incident while you're doing uh, your attack. And so you have to make sure that the actions that you take are logged in such a way that if someone came back to you and said, hey, I need a 100% accurate timeline, you could provide one and that that timeline would be uh, concrete in such a way that there would be no way that someone can say, okay, this is potentially not you. So the way we looked at this is we said, okay, we need to be able to operate outside the boundaries of our blue team. For the most part, obviously there are some scenarios where there will be data that is too sensitive that we don't want to have ever leave the uh, internal network. And I'll, I'll cover how we deal with that further on too. And we decided that, you know, based on the sensors and the control that our blue team has, right? So they obviously have things that they can collect from on host. So you have like uh, memory dumps, uh, event logging, uh, defensive tooling, which is deployed to the host, uh, isolation, these things that impact the host or the resource, be it PaaS or an IaaS uh, system uh, that they can use. But then there's also network collection. And so the network collection is a, a good indicator of who it is, right? If you can see traffic and it's going to say an IP and it's hosted out of say Panama and it just kind of terminates there in some small ISP, it's a lot harder to figure out who it is. And so what we've decided to do is to use infrastructure that is actually outside our boundary. Now we treat it a little bit differently, right? Cause we treat that infrastructure as that it's like pre-pwned that at any given time it is compromised. And so no credential that is used to manage it or set it up is ever used anywhere else. We then treat the data that goes through it as exposed data, right? So it has to be encrypted uh, using a standard that meets the internal company standard before it ever leaves the network. So this actually adds a fair amount of overhead to us because we have to design this into our tooling and I'll talk about this uh, later on. Um, but it allows us to then send data, have it go to say an untrusted resource and then come back to us without exposing what that data is. And then we're simply relying on scale to hide. Now, this forces the blue team to respond differently. I can't just say, hey, it's going to the red team's Azure subscription, it's that. This forces them to treat something when they find it as a potential real incident. And I have an implementation example here of Nginx pass through proxies. Uh, this is not necessarily how our tooling works, um, but it is a very simple example that you can set up if this is something you want to replicate inside your company. So continuing on, let me uh, kind of talk about how this works from a diagram perspective. So you've got your cloud providers and I've got a bunch of them listed here. Uh, these are just kind of the most popular ones. You should pick one that is local to your region of the world, somewhere where you have a fairly good working relationship and you might want to contact them and say, hey, are you okay if I am using your service for red team? Uh, one of the things that we have found is if it is that your blue team is treating it properly like a real incident, they might actually reach out to that cloud provider to potentially attempt to get telemetry. And so you want to account for that scenario. 
All right, we've got Microsoft and on the left side, uh, we've got say the server and then we've got our infrastructure, right? So our internal loot server, our C2 server, our, our ultimate, I guess, data stores have to reside on premises within our company boundaries, right? You don't want to, to post that somewhere. Don't use a Dropbox or a Google Drive or somewhere else, right? Um, but you, you want to be able to obscure who you are and where you're coming from. And so if you're doing like an Nginx pass through proxy, you'll have your implant or agent running on the box. And then you'll be talking to and from a cloud provider and you'll have that proxy, which is out there that takes that traffic and sends it back to you. And uh, you don't just want one proxy um, because if you have one, then you'll just say, okay, there's traffic going to this IP. What else is talking to this IP? Um, and they'll know that it's you, right? So you're gonna need to have multiple hops in the area. And for certain things, this does introduce the challenge of latency. And so you'll have to figure out how to deal with that um, and, and make your red teams uh, more planful so that when an operator takes actions, uh, those actions uh, are not going to fail because of latency. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle. Awesome. Thank you, Caleb. So our next handcuff is a restraint against attacking our coworkers' personal devices. So attackers obviously don't have any rules against attacking personal devices. They really don't distinguish. But as a red team at Microsoft, we do have a strong barrier against going after our coworkers' cell phones or personal laptops they bring onto campus. We also can hack random software companies to perform some kind of software supply chain attack against our employees, as that would also be against our rules of engagement and highly illegal in the US where we reside. So this matters because of the advent of bring your own device. Bring your own device results in loose boundaries between the personal and the corporate data in regards to cell phones and personal laptops. To maintain trust between our team, the company, and our employees, we do not attack the non-company owned or issued devices. We have no desire to have our coworkers believe we're snooping around in their personal lives. In a lot of ways, a good red team engagement requires a good working relationship with our customers so that the bug closure process can run smoothly. It's also very common that we'll reassess certain highly critical teams because our schedule is based on risk, meaning you don't want to burn a bridge with somebody during the readout process over F because you've overreached your boundaries and then have to come back around in six months or a year or a year and a half and have to meet with that person again in the future and work together with them. So our solution is quite simple. Uh, in many cases, we assume breach. What this means is we start most pen tests from inside our base corporate network, unless a public CTP is expressly requested or the service has a lot of internet facing perimeter surface area that should be assessed from a black box perspective. Uh, we assume breach because we have an assumption and have proven multiple times in the past that in a company with 140,000 employees, someone will inevitably always click the link for a phishing campaign. We then start our assessment from a view of the network that any attacker would have after a successful phishing attack and utilize the information, tools, and privileges of the common internal network user to then begin our attack chain and spread our influence over the target network. Our next limitation is based around tool set development. Um, I'd like to think that we're a well-funded team and you know we, we have great talent on the team, but there's only eight of us and there are adversaries that Microsoft has to deal with that are more sufficiently budgeted than our red team and have a lot more people attacking our, our company 24 seven, 365. Adversaries are routinely building customized malware to target their desired end goal within Microsoft. Our ops are a very fast paced cadence. They can be as long as eight to 12 weeks or as short as two weeks, which gives us 10 whole business days. While the real bad guys out there can attack Microsoft for decades and have been. This really limits our flexibility when coding customized malware for our engagements. This results in a trade-off between what we are able to fully implement versus what we have to inform the customer via a tabletop or something of a risk that they have that we can't prove fully to exploitation at the time. But we do have a solution for this. Uh, it's, it's basically a solution via an effective partnership. We work with our blue teams and agree on what is signatured and how they signature 
the reused malware that is built by our team. This allows us to still write customized tool sets, but not have to retool for every two week engagement. We, we have a concept of silent alerts that allow us to alert on our activity from our customized malware. So we're not creating and harboring zero days within Microsoft, but we're still able to effectively use our tooling before periodically aging some tooling out and, and coding new stuff. Uh, we make sure that we hire folks for our team who can code. Uh, the ability to code is seen as a certain level of literacy to be an effective red teamer, because in, in every single assessment you ever do, there's going to be cases where manual effort won't fit within our time constraints. And, you know, you think of that movie hacker and how, you know, you're in the basement in the dark with the hoodie furiously typing away at the keyboard. Uh, like a lot of it is actually like squinting and scrolling and, and having to parse large file dumps or, you know, large, large file shares for secrets or credentials. And a lot of that is not viable within our time constraints unless you can code parsers and regexers and, and, and be able to script up a lot of the things that you would otherwise do manually. Um, now I'm gonna hand it back off to Caleb for another couple handcuffs. Sure, so one of the things that Kyle has kind of alluded to is that we have a fairly tight partnership with our blue team. And so our blue team is split into several different areas. So we've got uh, detections and these are the people that build say signatures. We've got hunt. These are the people that look for, uh, I guess, malicious actors in the network. And then we've got incident response. And those are the people that actually go out and do the eviction. And as part of our work, we want to test all three of those areas. And so, Although we do partner with them, there will be cases where we'll compromise a system and we'll want to do something bad to it, right? This is pretty common uh, as any sort of red team op goes. And so oftentimes adversaries will get on a box, right? And one of the first things they'll do if it's a Windows system is they'll say enable WGIGEST, right? And that will let them capture plain text passwords or they'll uh, enable skeleton keys. So that way they have some sort of backdoor that's present on the system. Uh, I've got some noted here that they'll drop say a web shell on the box and they'll use a commodity password or something common. So say GitHub malware. And the reason why they'll do this is one, it helps them uh, maintain persistence on the system, which is something they want to do. And that commodity malware may evade the defensive components. And so that's how they may deal with not having to retool for each time. If someone has built a tool out there that already works, they're going to use it. And then it will potentially also obfuscate who they are, right? It's very hard to do attribution if you find something and you go out and you look at what that web shell is and it's just some generic web shell off GitHub. You cannot use that file then as a signature or any sort of indicator for who the attacker might be. Now, you might over time realize that a certain subset of attackers prefer that sort of implementation, but it's not a solid indicator. And so it's something that they'll often do. We, on the other hand, can't really afford to do this. And so the reason is because when we're working with our customers and our partners, we can't have a system that is uh, weak. So hold on a moment. I need to click through. Next slide. Awesome. So because I don't ever want to like pop a box, make it weaker, and then have someone else pop it during the course of me doing my work, especially if we're doing like a perimeter compromise, right? And so we have a guarantee to our customers, and this is actually written in our rules of engagement, that any secrets or any data that we find, we will store in a the same state or a greater state of security from how we found it, right? So obviously this means we have a loot server, we have like a kind of a sort of an enclave where we keep this sort of stuff, and then we have to figure out um, what are we going to do with the systems that we compromise, right? Um, one of our worst fears would be if we compromised a system and someone came in behind us on that same attack path, uh, and then there was an actual incident. And this has happened to red teams before, right? There are, are many known cases out there in the wild where people have taken over implant networks, particularly if you're using a commodity product like Cobalt Strike, um, where that network will get compromised by a third party attacker. And so being Microsoft, and as Kyle mentioned, we're kind of a code heavy engineering focused team. Uh, we do write the vast majority of our own tooling. We don't tend to purchase any sort of COTS product. Um, our tooling has to go through the same release process that any publicly available product from Microsoft does, right? So what this means is we are a red team and uh, we have a sister team, which is an application security team that does code review. And our tooling gets held up to the same standard of code quality as uh, a normal public product that they would review, right? So they're going to check it for the same sort of flaws. They're going to give us the same sort of bugs. We have to be able to deal with them, solve them, and have the same sort of release process, right? And then obviously, we have a deconfliction process internally. And so it's 
it's fairly standard as part of the incident response process that eventually there will reach a point in time where they'll want to know if it's a red tumor or not. And depending on how the operation is going, um, we may tell them, hey, this is not us or this is us, uh, depending on what we're doing. Um, but there is a, a time limitation there, right? So I have to be able to respond within a certain amount of time. I don't want to get an email from them and be like, hey, I'll get back to this tomorrow um, if in the event it is a real attacker, right? Because I need to know that they can continue to do their job and continue to respond uh, regardless of uh, what we are doing, right? Now, oftentimes we may actually find real malware on a system. This does happen occasionally uh, where you'll pop a box and someone else may have beaten you to that. So in that case, uh, we follow the standard incident response process. We terminate the test and then we do tell the blue team, hey, go do your job. And so those tests, obviously, uh, we stay out of their way, right? Um, we do get involved somewhat in the incident response process to provide an attacker mindset, but that's like a very small subset of our actual, um, I guess, job duties, right? And then lastly, if we find a, a critical vulnerability um, that is not an ODA, right? So ODAs are kind of unique because if I find an ODA in code, um, there are certain things that I can do to see if anyone else is potentially aware of that that ODA exists, right? And so ODAs actually represent, say, less risk in some cases. In some cases, obviously, there are exceptions to this rule than, say, an NDA vulnerability. Say I find an unpatched uh, Windows 2003 box that's sitting somewhere in an environment uh, that has been unmaintained and, you know, it is, say, publicly accessible or it exposes, say, important customer data. And I'm able to compromise it, right? Uh, I would tell the blue team right away. And so usually we have a partner or someone that in their chain that is aware of what our testing schedule is. So it might be someone fairly high up, um, like an executive in some sort, but we will let that person know and then let them make the call whether or not they want to have someone on the blue team go immediately investigate that system to look for indicators of compromise. And this is important because we don't want to continue on doing the test if that box is already popped. The idea being that we are reducing the risk to the company. So Kyle mentioned earlier, and I'm kind of going to dig deep into this here because we have some specific tooling that I'm going to walk through how it works in a minute that we have built to deal with this problem. So our tests are time boxed, right? We don't have forever to go test anything. And because there's eight of us and we have a fairly large scope, when you say just take us one component of our scope. So gaming, uh, we have all the game studios uh, in Xbox. And I think that's like 12 now. We have these, we obviously have Xbox itself. We have the services that support Xbox. And then we have any other say research or external things or, or whatever else they're working on. That alone could occupy the entire team for a year. And that excludes things like devices and cosine, which are also in our scope. Now, active malware people, people that are attempting to attack us, they will have automation. They will continuously be watching our environment. They will be waiting for that one slip up to get in. We don't necessarily have that opportunity, right? If there's a product that's coming out, I may have to test it prior to release. And so I will have a set schedule of not only when I have to test it, but of how long I have to test it. Um, and that's challenging for us, right? Um, I may have limitations or places, times when they would prefer I not test. Like, hey, uh, product release. but I have to be very careful that I don't cause any adverse business impacts. And so we have built some particular tooling that we use internally to deal with this. And so one of the things that I think that is important for every red team pen test, and this uh, obviously only applies to internal red teams, right? So consultant red teams won't be able to do this, but uh, we maintain persistence, right? The idea being that even though we, since we don't breach the perimeter every single time, as Kyle mentioned, we'll, we'll do an assumed breach. When we do breach the perimeter, which happens I don't know, every few tests, depending on what the scenario is, we'll try and find places where we can maintain a foothold within the environment that we can potentially use later on to start our test. And this provides us several major advantages. It, it forces the hunt portion of the blue team to always be looking for that irregular signal, to be figuring out where we chose to stash um, our persistence, and then be figuring out where their telemetry gaps are, because we may be able to identify a system where there is no telemetry, establish persistence there. And so they'll have to make sure that their own internal tooling and processes are up to par in order to track where we've been and what we do. Uh, when we finish a test, we do tell them our attack chain, but we don't tell them everything, right? There is a, an internal decision uh, that gets made on what data to share, right? Um, we also have automation that watches a lot of things. So there is a, a, an entire tool set that I don't talk about here um, for helping us uh, do that reconnaissance portion in advance. So we try and shorten that as much as possible. And to do that, we have automation that we can run in, I'd say, a course of two to three hours, and I can get as much information about my target as possible. 
and that's broken into authenticated and unauthenticated data sets, and then we can decide what to use uh, as part of the test. And all this only works if you have a schedule, right? You have to know what you're going to test when, so then you can pre-stage some of your things and you can be like, okay, we're going to activate uh, this persistence mechanism here and we're going to use it. And so going on to our persistence mechanism and, and tooling, this is kind of what it looks like. And I don't have a code sample to share to you because um, obviously this is an internal tool and we're not uh, about to release it to the public. Um, but this is generally what the architecture design is like. And there are, I believe there are some uh, solutions that are out there that are somewhat similar that are open source. So on the, the left side of the document, we've got our targets. And so you've got servers, laptops, desktops, whatever. You've got the places where you're going to compromise. And this is where we'll put our persistence mechanisms is usually in what I consider an IaaS asset. So infrastructure as a service. Although you can um, compromise and persist in some PaaS, so platform as a service uh, things too. But for the most part right now, we target IaaS systems to persist in. And then in the transport area, uh, I've got once again, cloud providers as mentioned earlier, but I've also got other things. And I'm going to pick on one particular example here as part of this. And so, uh, so this little triangle thing with like uh, four dots and a, a couple of lines between it is uh, I believe Azure Artifact Service. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Azure Artifact Service, basically it's a location that lets you publish like a package and then something can consume that package for use in their application. Uh, similar to NPM, NuGet, uh, et cetera, all the other package management repositories out there. And so what we're going to do is we have registered, say I went out and got a Hotmail account, I registered an artifact on Azure Artifact Service, and I have nothing there, all right? And this is kind of important. So one of the major advantages that this sort of uh, design has is that it doesn't require two-way communication. So uh, in the example that I presented earlier, using the multiple hops through the cloud, you have two-way communication, right? And so if you're custom writing your own sort of uh, encapsulation for that, uh, it gets hard because you have to track the state of that communication, the data that's going over. And if it's an unreliable transport, such as UDP, uh, you once again have to know when to resend and uh, request additional packets, right? Um, it's like basically you have a VPN. Uh, I do recommend everybody build one of those at some point in time using Python. It's just, uh, it's a crazy experience and it will teach you a lot about what goes into network protocols and design, um, but you may not want to do that for your stuff. Now, with this design, we don't have two-way communication, right? Um, all our agent is going to do is it's going to check Azure Artifact Service and it's simply going to say, is there a package there? Is there a package there? Is there a package there? And there might not be a package there for the vast majority of the time. And now when we do an op, we stand up a C2, right? And so this is some, you know, our custom internal tooling software. And uh, we have some storage. So we have say Azure storage, we're using that as a queue. And we're going to want to activate uh, an implant uh, on one of these targets, all right? And this will work for things that need to either um, be inside or outside the corporate network. And so we're going to take our implant and we're going to jump it in that storage mechanism. So we'll, we'll generate one on the C2. Our implants are custom generated for each target because um, we bake in specific things like crypto keys, et cetera. And then we're going to put it on that Azure Artifact service. So I will publish an update, right? And it's important if you note that there are also arrows to the other things, because I need to make sure that my implant is, or my persistence mechanism is still calling back, right? And, and we'll do like long haul. Like I'll have a persistence mechanism that calls back maybe once a month, right? Or maybe I think, I think we have some that might call back like once every three months, in fact, right? So they don't echo back very frequently. And they might be some, hey, we backdoored this like binary on a host like paint and it only launches irregularly when someone launches paint. But it launches and it talks to one of these transports in such a way that I can get a log that says, hey, this called back, right? Because I have to know that it's still active. Anyways, I'll take my implant. Um, whoops, wrong button. And uh, I will then want to ship it to the, through a transport down to the target, right? And so say email, right? Um, say I have a, a browser add-on that is dropped somewhere that checks, you know, a Gmail account for new messages every 60 days, right? I'll send an email to it. That browser icon will see it. It'll download it. It'll execute that implant as a separate process often, right? So it doesn't maintain, doesn't stay within the same process. And then that implant will directly establish communications with the C2 and I can start my hopping off point. And so the advantage of this is that each one of the things are kind of separate, right? The controller, the storage, and the C2 and the stuff that manage in the back end. Yeah, that, that's a PaaS app, right? It can run on its own. It can be written in C sharp. And then the persistence mechanisms that run on the target, they can be customized throwaway binaries that are written for each area where I'm persisting, right? And they're small. 
They don't need to handle, you know, a lot of communication. They just need to check for something. If there's something there, then they retrieve it, they check a cryptographic signature, and then they execute it, right? And that, that sort of thing gives me the ability to make a lot of small throwaway droppers where I can reuse bits of code. They're hard to signature for the blue team, and they can check different protocols and different transports, right? libcurl is a great library to learn how to use for this because it can talk over almost anything. Um, and then you can retrieve your implant and you can do your activity. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle to wrap up. Kyle, you're muted. There always has to be one, huh? All right. So although our red team can have arbitrary constraints that a real adversary would not, uh, we can be just as effective, if not more effective, through our partnerships with the blue team and by being adaptive in the way we operate and think about attacking our assets. We have the privilege of attacking the same company over and over and over. This allows us to gain an internal knowledge of what works and how to do our job more efficiently when compared to the contract pen tester who is challenged to start from scratch with every new customer. In our team, we've heavily adopted the purple team mentality in an effort to use our internal knowledge, toolings, and partnerships to identify threats more efficiently than attackers and close them, hopefully, before the attackers can find them. This includes writing tooling periodically that will identify problems, not just in a small scope or on our target service, but at a systemic scale so that we can solve these problems for the entirety of the company and close gaps across hundreds of thousands of servers. If you're encountering problems due to your ROEs, think creatively about the situation. There may be an engineering solution or a team partnership that allows you to get to your end goal while still staying within the written confines of your contractual obligations. So I think that that is pretty much it. And we would love to open the floor up to any questions from anybody online. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. Actually, I do have uh, so, some uh, some questions. Uh, so there's something I always wondered: is how many red teams there are at Microsoft? Mm. Uh, I'll answer that, Kyle, if you're okay with it. So there are okay. what I would consider four main ones, right? And so the the areas of responsibility. Um, so there's an Azure red team, and they cover Azure services and Azure itself in general. There is M365, which generally covers Office and Office Client. And then there is a corporate red team, which covers some of the internal corporate systems. Um, all of them are fairly small, right? So uh, we do kind of meet together to share tooling and we do, I guess, coordinate our development efforts on some of the major tools that we use. Um, and then occasionally there's like one or two other people that may be doing red teaming exercises out there. Um, uh, but once again, that's the majority of the red teams at Microsoft. Yeah, I think when you talk about those one or two other people out there that are doing red team activities, some of our more major products will have dedicated attacker mindset security folks who will work on them. So like a big example is like SQL is a huge product, right? It's been in use for decades. That has its own kind of attacker mindset people that are constantly looking at it and ensuring every new update doesn't introduce old vulnerabilities or create new vulnerabilities. Yeah, oh, and I guess it's important to note that this excludes like client code security team, right? So there are separate, what I consider component pen test or code review teams for each product, right? So um, red teams specifically do not do that activity. I mean, we do it as part of our attacks and our compromise. Obviously, we love to steal source and then look for bugs in it. But there are dedicated code review teams for each of our major products. And uh, others that works are like the blue teams are like uh, usually in the, like not in the same team, but do they work like uh, together or is it hard to, to communicate uh, sometimes with like some of the other teams or is it like completely, like are they, just, are, are they like actually verticals, you know, like all those teams or is it more like silos? Um, so prior to Satya, I think things were very siloed, but under Satya, that siloing has more or less gone away. And so the way the blue teams work is they're like, it's kind of like a shared incident response center and they all contribute people to them. Um, to that area, although each blue team has a designated area of focus, right? So for example, our blue team is intimately familiar with like the gaming studios, which may not even host at Microsoft, right? 
and mm -hmm. the technologies that they use, which might be third-party cloud providers. Um, whereas, say, the Office 365 Blue Team is extremely familiar with Exchange and how it runs its platform, right? Um, a lot of times, our incident response process may require a code change, especially if someone is deploying an ODA against us, and the Blue Team needs to have super in-depth knowledge, not just of the environment in which uh, they are trying to, the infrastructure runs, but also of the software that they are attempting to, you know, protect. Um, but the blue teams all contribute like a shared resource on a fairly regular basis to this like shared response center, I guess. Um, and, and then from there, they can coordinate and work with each one of the red teams. Now, that said, we do have a partner blue team that works directly against us, right? So their name is Fire and we're Serpent, right? And we attack resources primarily that they defend um, to, trust, to test them and their capabilities to respond within that area. Um, I think that's an answer to your question. Kyle, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I think as far as communicating with the blue team, um, over the last five years that I've been uh, pen testing at Microsoft, I've seen the relationship become a lot more collaborative versus combative. When I first mm -hmm. got there, there's a, a, a large us versus them mentality. And now I think a lot of that's gone away. And you know, I've worked with this blue team for nearly five years. I consider a lot of them, you know, really good friends and they're right down the hallway. And, you know, you might be hiding from them at 1115, deploying malware and at 1130, you're going out to lunch with them. You know, hey, how's, how's life? How's it going? How are the kids? So it's just, it's kind of funny. Um, but then also, you know, when, when the proverbial shit hits the metaphorical fan, right? And we have bad guys in our network that are overlapping with one of our pen tests, and this has happened before, we are not allowed to pen test anymore. That is it. We don't want to muddy the water. We don't want to make their job more difficult so that they'd have to pick and choose, okay, this traffic looks like Kyle versus this. We have no idea. Um, so, I mean, at that point, we're not busy anyways. And if it, if it gets bad, like our attacker mindset can be used in a defensive way. And lending our attacker mindset to our blue team in a time of need, it's, it's, it's a really fun exercise. And I feel like as an attacker, I learn a lot from these periods of times where I'm not allowed to attack anything because I'm getting to, you know, kind of shoulder ride the real thing. So I, I think that's a cool collaboration between our two teams. And what about the, uh, the purple team? Is it like a third separate team or is it just like whenever you do like joint exercise? Yeah, no, that, that's more of a process. Um, the purple team is more of a process. It's usually when we do joint things where a red team is going to be black boxed, not announced. One person on the blue team might know so that they can deconflict if it gets bad, but the rest of the team has to treat it like it's real. Whereas a purple team, we're really going through um, security promises with our customers, what they think they're doing right, how they think they're doing it right what guarantees they're making themselves and their customers, and then sitting down with our blue team and going, okay, yeah, so promises one, three, and five, they're good. Two and four, they think they're doing a good job, they're not, and we're gonna prove it. We're gonna go attack it right now, see if you see anything, or right, I'm gonna go back to my desk. And, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to get a more comprehensive test of a product's security than a red team, where, because a red team reveals a risk and a red team will give you the why you need to do security, but at its base, a red team engagement is usually the fastest way in, the fastest way out. You know, it's, it can be anything from a smash and grab to a long kind of low troll where we're trying to be silent and and get that persistence. So there's there's a variance to the the noise or the aggressiveness of a red team, but a purple team is going to be pretty consistent, pretty comprehensive. Imagine a chain where you start, you find a vulnerability here to get to your end goal. Well, okay, we, we do that. We talk to the customer and our blue team. We fix this vulnerability. We start back up here again. Okay, well, there's this other thing over here. Okay, and then we get to the end goal. Okay, now we fix this. Now we have this thing over here. So whereas a red team's only gonna test that one chain, you know, one objective, and then the test is gonna wrap up. A purple team's gonna be more comprehensive in that we are going to basically file the bugs we find as we find them, discuss them in our weekly standups with the customer we're assessing, and our blue team is going to be able to kind of ride the whole the whole show, and it's I think it's a good process. I feel like our, our bug quality from those are, are fairly high. 
I see. And just uh, so, so if I understood the, correctly, so the serpent team is customer facing or when you say our customers, you just mean generally uh, for the products? Uh, yeah, this this actually uh, everybody, this confuses everybody. Uh, when I mention our customers, I am talking about Microsoft services and cosine devices. Okay, or, okay. Or, okay. So they, they are our customers. But yeah, it is not public facing. And, and what's the name of the blue and red team at uh, Azure? Uh, so no. the Azure team is called uh, Art Azure Red Team, and I think their blue team is simply called Azure Blue Team. We have the coolest okay. name. <laughs> yeah, coolest so name, I was supposed to say like it is uh, this is what like Serpent Fire. Yeah. Serpent and Fire is our that's our red and blue team. Okay, okay. What what, what about the 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 team of uh, Dave Weston with uh, with Jordan and everything? What's their name? So they are they are like the client security offensive team, right? Um, so his team does like security mitigations and defensive measures that are on the Windows product that is on your desktop, right? Yeah. And so that's that's their scope, right? Yeah. So um, it's it's slightly different. Whereas Kyle, Kyle, I'll let you explain a little bit what our scope was again. So again, our scope is anything Windows not on your computer, anything devices. Like Which Azure Sphere, for instance. Azure Sphere, for instance. Okay, cool. So, so any any any, uh, any tips for people who are trying to get the code execution in the Pluton subsystem? None that we're willing to share. <laughs> okay. So it's like. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, yeah, no. What, what, what about um, say getting like serial debugging on it? Like any any tips? <laughs> We, uh, I think, we cannot I think provide you're with you any tips, tips. We wouldn't be allowed to talk publicly anymore. I know, I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Um, cool. Uh, is this a question from uh, Ale uh, Alex uh, in the chat? It's like, uh, what is the coolest uh, logo? <laughs> uh, we have the best logo. Yeah, we definitely have the best logo. Is, is it the red one from like the first slide? It is. Yeah. We is, have it design, a, a is it designed internally? That's a good question for Alex. Because it's true. I saw it. I was like, it's kind of cool. It looks like some like HackerCon like uh, logo, you know? Yeah. So we've got that. We're making T-shirts. You know, we're all getting the tattoo. Uh, it's like uh, <laughs> it's like the people at Immunity when they used to get the Immunity uh, logo tattoo. But it was an easier one to make. You know, that one uh, is probably gonna hurt a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, what's nice about the logo is it, it shows that serpent actually stands for something and we're not just trying to be cool. So like we'll go into our presentation and be like, oh, serpent team. Oh, services pen test. I get it now. You know, it's kind of yeah, a background. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. Also with the PCB type of uh, thing in the background. Yeah, definitely you're going to ask Alex if it was done. Uh, internally but uh, yeah, it's it's a good one well uh there's uh, no no more questions so any last words uh, guys um i guess i'm gonna offer like uh, you know this is a community of people that have a strong interest in offensive security and it's pretty awesome and i would encourage you to continue along that chain like one of the things that we need in this area is diversity right we need people that are innovative we need people that are creative people that want to solve the hard problems of the future and you know our team is fairly static. We haven't really had anybody join or leave the team within a couple of years, but there will come points in time where we will need new talent and new minds from the industry. And so um, I would just say, you know, thank you for having us on and please continue to do what you do. It is important for the security, not just of Microsoft, but for all the, the world really. It does have an impact and we do appreciate your efforts. Yeah, I guess all I would add is that uh... You know, when I first joined Microsoft, I was a little skeptical. Um, you know, I imagined, you know, kind of large corporation, lots of suits. It, it wouldn't be my thing. But after getting kind of my feet on the ground and getting going, I realized this is, this is a place I could potentially work for life. And the team culture, at least within my security organization, is solid and collaborative and, and like a big family. I mean, uh, like Alex and Caleb were at my wedding, you know, it's, it's not like I just see these guys from, from nine to five, like we're, we're actually close. And, uh, 
I think that's important when you want to have a, a job that you you enjoy. And yeah, I mean, it's been a, a great place to work and a challenging atmosphere. So uh, just wanted to say like my, my assumptions about pen testing in large corporate environments were definitely changed. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, definitely when, uh, a good company to be at. Well, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, thanks again, guys, uh, for speaking and uh, joining us. Uh, well, I hope to uh, talk to you soon. And next time I'm in Seattle, I will uh, come say hi. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Our thanks, pleasure. Guys.